Hi, room 15. This is chapter 22, Thorn Valley, Secret of Nim. It might almost be easier to tell what wasn't in it, Nicodemus continued. That truck was a ro as roomy as a small bus, and the old man hadn't wasted a square foot of it. Not that it was cluttered. On the contrary, everything was neatly in place on its shelves or hook or in its cabinets. It took us a while to understand what a treasure we had found. The truck contained, as you might expect, a big stock of toys. It also contained the old man's simple living quarters, a cot, a lamp, a work table, a folding chair, a bucket for carrying water, a, pla a plate, pots, pans, and so on. There was a tiny refrigerator with food in it and some canned stuff, peas, beans, peaches, things like that. Most of the toys we thought at first we had no particular use for. There were toys, uh, there were toy automobiles and trucks, windmills and merry-go-rounds, airplanes, boats, and lots of others, mostly run on batteries. It was entertaining to look at them, and some of them were even were even tr we even tried out. For a while, the floor looked like Christmas morning. We tired of that and explored further into the truck. Up near the front, we found several large cardboard boxes, and when we opened them, we found that they were full of electric motors of assorted size, replacement engines for broken or worn out toys. There were dozens of them, ranging from small, very small, no bigger than a spool of thread, up to some so heavy we could hardly move them. Then next to these, we found the real treasure, the old man's tools. They were neatly arranged in shining rows inside a steel cabinet as big as a trunk. There were screwdrivers, saws, hammers, clamps, vices, wrenches, pliers. There were welding tools, sold, soldering irons, and electric drills. And the beauty of it was, since they were designed for working on toys, they were nearly all miniature, easily small enough for us to handle. Yet they were themselves not toys. They were made of the finest tempered steel, like the tools of a watchmaker or a dentist. It was Arthur who said it first. Do you realize what we've got here? We could open our own machine shop. With these tools and all these motors, we could make anything we wanted. We could, said Jenner, except you've forgotten one thing. What's that? We have no electricity. The old man couldn't have run these tools off batteries. The small toy motors, yes, but not the real ones, not the power tools. He had to plug it into house current to use those. See, there's an extension cord on the wall. There was a long coil of heavy black cable hanging from the hook on the wall. It had a plug on one end and a socket on the other. Now another rat spoke up, a rat named Sullivan. He was a great friend of Arthur's and, like him, had a particular interest in entrance and electricity. Maybe, he said, we could plug it into house current, too. How, I said, who would let us do that? Do you remember that cave we looked at the other day, the one we decided was too close to the farmhouse? And that was the beginning of it. The end you have seen yourself. He was speaking of the cave you saw today. We all trooped back to it and examined it more carefully. It was too close, or at least closer than we had planned to live to a human habitation. But then we saw the rose huge rose but well, then we saw the huge rose bush near the tractor shed where, with quite a lot of digging, we could put a concealed entrance. But most important we noticed that there was an electric light in the tractor shed. Mr. Fitzgibbons had an underground power cable leading up from his house to the shed. We dug a tunnel to it, taped it, and we all had electricity we needed. Near it ran a water pipe. We tapped that too, and we had running water. Then, a few at a time, we moved the tools and the motors from the toy tinker's truck to the cave. We got nearly all of them before the truck disappeared. We went back one day, and it was gone. Only the hole remained, where its tires had been sunk in. The forest rangers must have found it and hauled it away, but they never discovered or disturbed the mound where the old man lay buried. So we built ourselves the lives you see around you. Our colony thrived and grew to 115. We taught our children to read and write. We had plenty to eat, running water, electricity, a fan to draw on fresh air, an elevator, a refrigerator. Deep underground, our home stayed warm in the winter and cool in the summer. It was a comfortable, almost luxurious existence. And yet, all was not well. After the first burst of energy, the moving in and of the machines, the digging in the tunnels and the rooms, after that was done, a feeling of discontent settled upon us like some creeping disease. We were reluctant to admit it at first. We tried to ignore the feeling or to fight it off building more things, bigger rooms, fancier furniture, carpeted hallways, things we did not really need. I was reminded of a story I had read at the Boniface estate when I was looking for things written about rats. It was about a woman in a small town who bought a vacuum cleaner. Her name was Mrs. Jones. And up until then, she, like all of her neighbors, had kept their houses spotlessly clean by using a broom and a mop. But the vacuum cleaner did it faster and better. And soon Mrs. Jones was the envy of all the other housewives in town, so they all bought vacuum cleaners too. The vacuum cleaner business was so brisk, in fact, that the company that made them opened a branch factory in that town. 
The factory used a lot of electricity, of course, and so did the women with their vacuum cleaners. So the local electric power company had to put up a big new plant to keep them all running. It, in, its furnaces, in its furnaces, the power plant burned coal, and out of its chimney, black smoke poured day and night, blanketing the town with soot and soot and making all the floors dirtier than ever. Still, by working twice as hard and twice as long, the women of the town were able to keep their floor almost as clean as they had before Mrs. Jones ever bought a vacuum cleaner in the first place. The story was part of a book of essays, and the reason I had read it so eagerly was that it was called The Rat Race, which I learned means a race where no matter how fast you run, you don't get anywhere. But there was nothing in the book about rats, and I felt bad about the title because I thought it wasn't a rat race at all. It was a people race, and no sensible rat would ever do anything so foolish. And yet here we were, rats getting caught up in something a lot like the people race, and for no good reason. And the worst thing was that they didn't that even with our make-work projects, we didn't really have enough to do. Our life was too easy. I thought of what the scientists had written about our prairie dog ancestors, and I was worried. So were many of the others. We called a meeting. Indeed, a whole series of meetings extending over more than a year. We talked and argued and considered, and we remembered our evenings in the library at the Boniface Estate when we had wondered about a rat civilization and what it would be like. Oddly enough, Jenner, my old and best friend, took little part in these discussions. He remained rather glumly silent and seemed dis disinterested, but most of the others felt as I did, and slowly some things became clear. We saw our problems and we figured out, as well as we could, what to do about them. First, we realized that finding the toy tinker's truck, which had seemed like an enormous stroke of luck, had in fact led us into the very trap we should have avoided. As a result, we were now stealing more than ever before, not only food, but electricity and water. Even the air we breathed was drawn in by a stolen fan run by a stolen current. It was this, of course, that made our life so easy that it seemed pointless. We did not have enough work to do because a thief's life is always based on somebody else's work. Second, there, were always, there was always a fear in the back of all of our minds that we would get caught. Or perhaps not caught, we took precautions against that, so much as found out. Mr. Fitzgibbons was surely aware that some of his crops were being removed, and as our group grew larger, we would have to take more and more. Already he had begun lining some of his grain bins with steel metal. That didn't bother us particularly because we had to we knew how to get the doors open. But suppose he should take to locking them. We could cut through the locks, of course, or even through the steel sheet metal walls. We have the tools for that, but it would be a dead giveaway. What would Mr. Fitzgibbons think about a rat who could cut through metal? All of these things were we worried about and talked about and puzzled over, but we could not find any easy answer because there was none. There was, however, a hard answer. I began walking, long, taking long walks into the forest. I had an idea in the back of my head. Sometimes I went alone. Sometimes I went with others. On one particular day, I went with Jenner. I had not yet told him about my idea, nor did I on the morning we set out, but merely proposed a direction. We took along enough food for lunch. I remember that it was autumn, a bright, co bright cool day. The leaves made a rustling sound when the wind blew, and some were turning yellow. In my walks, I had been exploring the jeep trails, trying to find the wildest part of the forest, places where not even the rangers ever went. A few times I tried asking for information. I asked two squirrels, for instance, if they knew what lay on the other side of the mountain that rose before me. But they were silly, fearful creatures, and after looking at me in surprise, they both scurried up an oak tree and scolded senselessly in loud voices, shaking their tails until I left. I asked some chipmunks, and they were more polite. They couldn't answer my question, never have been further than a hundred yards from where they were born, but advised me to ask the birds, more specifically one bird, a very old owl who was famous throughout the forest. They even told me how to find the enormous tree in which he lived. That was the beginning of my acquaintance with the owl. He knew every tree, every trail, every stone in the forest. He was, as you know, not naturally friendly towards rats or mice either. But when I told him about our life at Nim and our escape, he grew interested. Though he did not say so, I think he had already been watching some of our activities from the air in the evenings. Anyway, he was curious and listened carefully when I told him about our problems and my ideas for solving them. I have talked to him many times since. It was he who told me about Thorn Valley. The valley lies deep in the forest, beyond the big tree. The jeep trails do not cross it, nor even go close to it, for the mountain around it are, forbi are forbidding, too steep and rocky even for jeeps. 
and are covered with thorny thickets. The owl told me that in all the years he'd been flying, he had never seen a human near it. Yet the bottom of the valley is level and broad and nearly a mile long, steep cliff walls in it all around. There are three ponds or small lakes in it, and apparently these are fed by springs, or they never dry up. For they never dry up. On clear days, the owl said he sometimes saw small fish swimming in them. I thought, could rats weave fish nets or make fish hooks? It was this valley I was looking for the day I set out with Jenner. I had careful directions from the owl, yet it took us a half a day, moving briskly to reach the base of the mountains. Then up, 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 very steeply for more than an hour. Not really difficult for us since rats are better climbers than men. Also, we are shorter, so we had little trouble with the spiny underbrush. Underbrush. From the top of the high ridge, at last we looked down, and the valley lay before us. It was beautiful and still, a wild and lonely place. Through the green and yellow treetops below us, I could see the water from one of our ponds sparkling in the sun. I got the idea that my eyes, our eyes, were the first to ever see it. Yet that was not true, for as we descended into the valley, a deer suddenly approached in the trees ahead and went bounding off down the slope. There were wild animals there, and I wondered if even suspected, if they even suspected, that outside these walls of mountains there were cities and roads and people. Most of the valley floor was in forest, great spreading oak and maple trees. Then near one of the ponds I saw what I had hoped to find, a large natural clearing, a glade where only coarse grass and wildflowers grew and some clumps of black raspberry bushes. This clearing was on the far side of the valley. Beyond it, the mountain wall rose again, a steep slope with big outcroppings of stone, granite ledges that thrust six or seven feet out of the earth. We could live here, I said to Jenner. I suppose we could, he said. It's a beautiful place, but it's a long way from the barn. Think of how far we'd have to carry food and no electricity. We could grow our own food, I said. I started to add, but didn't, and maybe someday make our own electricity, if we wanted to do that. We don't know how. Anyway, where would we grow it? Right here. It would be easy to clear away these weeds and bushes, and if we dig into that mountainside, under those rock ledges, we'd have all the cave space we wanted, warm, dry, with a good roof. There could be enough room for a thousand of us. There aren't a thousand of us, though. There might be, someday. But why? Why move? We've got a better place to live right now. We've got all the food that we want. We've got electricity and lights and running water. I can't understand why everybody talks about changing things. Because everything we have is stolen, I said. That's silly. Is it stealing when farmers take milk from cows or eggs from chickens? They're just smarter than the cows and the chickens, that's all. Well, people are our cows. It's we're smart enough. Why shouldn't we get food from them? It's not the same. Farmers feed the cows and chickens and take care of them. We don't do anything for what we take. Besides, if we keep it up, we're going to be sure found out. What then? What if we are? People have been trying to exterminate rats for centuries, but they haven't succeeded, and we're smarter than the others. What are they going to do? Dynamite us? Let them try. We'll find out where they keep the dynamite and use it on them. Then we'd really be found out. Don't you see, Jenner? If we ever did anything like that, they'd figure out who we are and what we know. Then only two things could happen. Either they'd hunt us down and kill all of us, or they'd capture us and put us in a sideshow, or maybe take us back to Nim and this time we'd never get away. I don't believe any of that, Jenner said. You've got this idea stuck in your head. We've got to start from nothing and work hard and build a rat civilization, I say. Why start from nothing if you can start with everything? We've already got a civilization. No, we haven't. We're just living on the edge of somebody else's, like fleas on a dog's back. If the dog drowns, the fleas drown too. That was the beginning of an argument that never had a satisfactory ending. Jenner would not yield to my point of view, nor I to his. It wasn't that he was lazy and didn't want to work. He was just more cynical than the rest of us. Stealing did not bother him, and he was a pessimist. He never believed that he could really make it on our own, and maybe he was right. But I, and most of the others, felt that we must at least try. If we failed, well, then I suppose we can just come back here, or find some other farm, or eventually forget all we learned and go back to stealing garbage. So we began working out the plan. It has been a long time coming. Three years ago this spring, we started watching Mr. Fitzgibbons to learn what he did and how he did it to bring food out of earth, out of the earth. We collected books and magazines on farming. We discovered early that in order to stop stealing, we would for a while have to steal more than ever. We laid up a two-year food supply so that even if we didn't succeed in growing in a good crop the first year, we wouldn't go hungry. We've got two-thirds of it moved to Thorn Valley already. 
and we've dug a dry cave to store it in under one of the big rocks. We've got seeds. We have our plows. We've cleared and cultivated part of the land near the pond. In a few days, we'll begin our first planting. We've even dug some irrigation ditches in case there's a drought. We have a schedule worked out, so, sort, of the count, sort of a countdown. And by early June, we will be out of this cave and out of Mr. Fitzgibbon's barn. I hope forever.